Good evening. And welcome to another Zoom event from the Northumberland Learning Connection or NLC. My name is Barb Woolley and I'm a member of the NLC board. And as you know, we're committed to bringing you great speakers, even though we can't be in person. We hope our events have provided a bright spot in this very difficult year. And I know tonight is going to provide one for sure. Barry Blitt is a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial cartoonist and illustrator who is also a longtime friend from our days at OCAD U, formerly known as OCA, in Toronto. Barry has always made me laugh. And as an editorial art director and designer myself, I always looked forward to the opportunity to work together. His watercolor drawings and ink drawings are deceptively sweet, but his acerbic wit and garnered from a keen observation can be rather subversive. Barry and I worked together on a number of magazines, including the back page of Harry Rosen's Harry magazine for over 10 years. He could even make prosaic menswear humorous. I followed Barry's career from his days working at Toronto Life to his over 100 New Yorker covers and his op-eds for the New York Times and every other major publication around the world. Truly, he's a once in a lifetime talent, maybe generational, <laughs> and I'm thrilled he is here to share his work and his stories with us tonight. We're also happy to welcome back a good friend of NLC, Karen Wells, to interview Barry and draw out a few of his most fascinating stories. Karen, I know you'll enjoy speaking with Barry. And despite the fact that you're a professional journalist, I challenge you not to laugh. Over to you. I should be on the screen. Am I there? I think so. Hello, Barb, and thank you, Barb. And for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Karen Wells and I am indeed a humorless journalist. The bulk of my career was with CBC News and Current Affairs. I'm also a lawyer, published a book last year and I'm working on another at the moment. And for the past several years, I've been moderating events like this for a number of different organizations. But let me get to the important stuff and tell you a little bit more about Barry Blitt. Born in Canada, in Montreal, moved, as Barb said, to Toronto to attend the Ontario College of Art and Design, then uh, moved to the United States. And he lives now in Connecticut, in fact, in the house where Arthur Miller wrote Death of a Salesman. So, you know, nice things wafting through the walls, one would think. And he has built a career as one of this continent's leading political cartoonists. He has done work for The New Yorker, the covers that you saw for Vanity Fair, for Time, Rolling Stone, The Atlantic, and illustrated Frank Rich's column in The New York Times. He's been given a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Art Directors Club of Canada, and he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 2020. And let me just read that citation, it's short for work that skewers the personalities and policies emanating from the Trump White House with deceptively sweet watercolor style and seemingly gentle caricatures. The format this evening, and if you've been with us before, you'll know this, Barb, uh, Barry will present um, more of, of his images, talk about his work. He and I will talk briefly and at around 8.15, we go to questions from the audience, so please keep them short, submit on the Q&A function, you know where that is on your computer, I hope, uh, and we will get to as many as we can. Our title tonight, How Far Is Too Far? Very apt in this time of political correctness and woke culture. And in Canada, well, there's a case going through the Supreme Court at the moment that deals with 
what counts as satire and what is going too far. There's one Canadian cartoonist who recently had his contract suspended for a cartoon that the publishers thought went too far. Fortunately, the Washington Post picked him up. And of course, nobody can forget, I don't think, the Charlie Hebdo shootings uh, that resulted in the deaths of 12 people and all of that sprang from a cartoon. So it's not easy doing what Barry Blitt does in many different ways. Now, let me hand it over to Barry Blitt to talk more about his work. Barry. Well, thank you, Karen, and thank you, Barb. Uh, and thank you to the Northumberland Learning Connection for inviting me here to talk about how far is too far. And uh, if you'll just pardon me while I fumble around here on the, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to get my slides ready here. Uh, okay, light table. You should go make yourself a sandwich or something. Uh, okay, so I think I go to slide only and then I go back to you and I press share screen and I do that. Okay, so I think this is how this works. Okay, I hope that works for everybody. And uh, I'm going to start my little talk here. How far is too far? I've scribbled a few quick drawings on the topic provided to me, uh, and uh, let's take a look at them now. I wonder, does this go too far? How about this? Is this too far? How about this? To me, an editorial cartoonist occupation is finding that line that separates too far from everything else and then playfully attempting to get as close to that line as possible. Now, what makes a person behave that way? Where does this mania come from to want to play with a dangerous line like that? Well, why don't you join me in this 20 minute quest of self-discovery and we'll try and find out. Uh, this was a drawing from a few months ago. It was the election day in the United States, election day 2020. And uh, this clear, clearly this image doesn't go too far in any direction. You don't wanna be screaming every time you say something. And this is more a meditation on the catharsis that was uh, inherent in that momentous day. And of course, thankfully that day led to this. I say thankfully because <laughs> Uh, it's hard not to fall clumsily on either side of the line, like a drunk failing a sobriety test over the last, you know, handful of years. It's been a, a very weird time to be a political cartoonist and to be an American, to be a citizen of the world. It seemed like every situation was incredibly dire. And peril was lurking behind every corner. There was general mayhem and indecency and bullying and coarseness as a matter of course. And don't forget ridiculousness. It was all overwhelming for a sensitive cartoonist like myself. I mean, I started to see him in my food. So why don't we go back to the beginning? Let's pull back a bit and try and get some context on this. Uh, this was a drawing I did as a child, all children draw. And judging by the stains, I'd say I couldn't have been more than four or five years old. I worshiped Popeye as a kid, just as I worshiped hockey players when I got a little bit older than that. And honestly, all of my artistic energies at that point uh, were spent on a hero worship. And it paid off. As a kid, I got to present Bobby Orr with a drawing on Hockey Night in Canada. That's me on the left, Bobby on the right. Um, I can still fit into that sweater vest, by the way. When I got to art school, the work I was doing was more, uh, well, not representational, but re you know, it was high realism, basically. I was drawing in pencil. And this kind of work wasn't suited to my temperament at all. 
you know, I, I wasn't getting much joy out of the creation of it. Uh, luckily, at the same time, though, I started experimenting with a pen and ink style, and this is a drawing I did in OCA that loosened me up a little bit, I think, and uh, it seemed more a more appropriate vehicle for this, you know, for the uh, sarcastic little crank that a difficult adolescence had turned me into. So I brought this kind of work and my realistic work around to art directors and uh, all of the art directors seem to like this sort of style. So this is an example of the illustration work I was getting and doing at the time, I think. And uh, I started submitting cartoons. It's weird talking about yourself for such a sustained period of time. Um, anyway, I started submitting cartoons to magazines and I was getting work doing popular culture work, uh, cartoons for Entertainment Weekly. And this is a, a drawing I did for Entertainment Weekly. Uh, it's about Michael Jackson. If any of you are uh, too young or too old to know who he was, he was uh, sort of an eccentric vaudevillian. Uh, this was a cartoon about Madonna's baby shower when she was pregnant for the first time. Uh, Madonna was a folk singer in the 1980s. Um, it was only when President Bill Clinton got involved with a young intern in the White House that it seemed that the worlds of pop culture and politics seemed to meld. And suddenly art directors were asking me for political drawings and ideas, even though I really knew nothing about politics and, and don't really know anything about it now. So I was drawing Bill Clinton a lot. Here's a cartoon of Bill and several of his... Uh, you know, the people he surrounded himself with. Janet Reno was a cooked goose. Bill Clinton was a lame duck. Monica Lewinsky was a swallow. Bill Clinton was a cartoon character, a trait he seems to compare uh, to uh, share with a lot of other presidents. And here he is, a family walk. And this is the first cartoon that I got, had published by The New Yorker. And, uh, this is a strange cartoon. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, I was thrilled to do a, a cartoon for the New Yorker, but this is just basically a catalog of fictitious allergies uh, experienced by, you know, various presidents. George Washington, ragweed, pollens, dust, grass, trees, Calvin Coolidge, egg yolks, milk, house dust, tobacco. I, I don't know. I guess it's absurd. But anyway, they ran it. And this was the first cover that I, uh, that the New Yorker published of mine when in, in uh, the beginning of 1994. It was around the time that smoking was, uh, secondhand smoke became an issue, I guess, and smokers had to step outside and you'd walk down the street and there'd be all these smokers. It seemed like a funny idea to have them standing on the ledges. So, and then I was, that was, was followed by you know, I continued doing New Yorker covers, nothing political yet really, but this was a play on the word doorman with all those locks that you see, all that apparatus in a New York apartment door. And this is uh, another one, in like a lion, out like a lamb. Nothing too far about this one. And here's another drawing that I have no idea what it means. It's called Commuter and he's, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to explain it. Low all these years later. Now this might be the first uh, New Yorker situation where I got into a tiny bit of trouble, if only with the editorial staff there. Tina Brown had come in and she wanted to modernize in the magazine and make it, you know, give it more buzz. And so this sort of mirrored a classic New Yorker cover where it has the sort of pastoral look to it. It's got the old fashioned uh, lifeguard station. But this was about the OJ Simpson trial, which is not the kind of thing that, that uh, a lot of editorial staff there felt should be on the cover of the magazine, the, you know, the vaunted literary magazine. But anyway, I was happy to, to bring the culture down with me. This one I really got into trouble for. Uh, this was uh, obviously, it's a sort of a satiric, it's a reference to the uh, Eisenstadt's famous photograph from 1945 from VJ Day. 
And it, I threw this around the time that Bill Clinton was implementing the don't ask, don't tell. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a law or a rule. It's about gays in the military. And uh, this seemed like a funny angle to take. Luckily, it was before email. So all the anger that was directed at me, I, I heard from you know, many, many conservatives with frayed nerves that they had to FedEx me or, you know, fax me. I guess I did get some telephone calls, but that was the extent of it. Now you do something untoward and uh, your, your email box fills up rather quickly. And, and I'll tell you about that soon too. Now, George W. Bush, another cartoon character like Bill Clinton, uh, this was Hurricane Katrina, and uh, obviously not a funny situation, so hard to wring a, a, an amusing drawing out of it. But this was my attempt to, to find a little absurdity in it. So here he is, you know, with his uh, inner circle, and they're sitting up to their nipples in, in, in dirty water in, in the Oval Office. And... <clears throat> I think this whole tableau was an excuse to draw George Bush like that as, as a Felix Unger character. He seemed to embody that quite well. You'd never see Dick Cheney lose control like that, but apparently the two of them were on the outs for a while. And uh, I guess that's not surprising. And this was after the Iraq, Iraq war, the you broke it, you own it pottery barn rule. I think that. Colin Powell uh, talked about. I mean, how much humor can you can you apply to a humanitarian crisis? Anyway, this is Obama and Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. When they the, the art director at the magazine Francoise Mouly <clears throat> asked if I had any ideas about the nasty campaign these two were running against each other in 2008 for the Democratic nomination. And I mentioned I had something that she would never go for because it featured the two of them in bed and I didn't think she'd want to look at that and would want to run it. But when I showed it, and they're basically, they're competing for that ringing red phone at three in the morning. And she liked it and they ran it. And she, you know, was stern with me after that and said, you know, don't self edit, show me whatever you've got. And, uh, this tactic proved dangerous later on. But here's a wholesome cartoon, a drawing that's not too far in any direction also. It's uh, Barack Obama choosing the family dog. He was doing that around the same time he was vetting his cabinet. So it seemed like a, seemed like two stories you could, you could put into one. And here's the rollout of Obamacare. Uh, and this is when it passed and Republicans were taking their medicine. And you can see a young Ted Cruz over there on the left. And there's Mitch McConnell uh, to his right, uh, who was always old. I, I can't believe that I didn't, I, I only recently when I look at this cover do I realize how clumsily I drew those Barack Obama's legs. I don't know how, I, how that got by me and got by anyone at the magazine, but oh well. This one went too far in a, in a strange direction. It, not too far, but it got me some very weird reactions. This is a, a drawing about New Jersey Governor Chris Christie. I don't know if you remember when he blocked the, the uh, GW bridge to get back at a political opponent, the George Washington Bridge. Now, you never know how people will react to a cartoon. And here it was because I know nothing about cars. I didn't learn to drive until I was 38. And uh, so when I had to draw, you know, a bunch of traffic coming at me. I just Googled oncoming cars and, and found a good picture and drew it. And I didn't realize that I'd drawn a Citroen there a second from right in the front row. And suddenly I started getting all these emails from Citroen fans thinking I'd done it on purpose. You know, they were 
they thought I was like winking at them and, you know, and it was like a secret message or something and they wanted to make me their leader. But of course I demurred. Um, this is Iran's president Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. I don't know if you remember when he came to the UN and announced that there are no homosexuals in Iran. And it was not long after a, uh, an American congressman was arrested soliciting sex in a men's room at, a, at an airport in Minnesota or something. So this seemed like a funny way again to tie two disparate stories together. Sometimes that's a, a funny way to make a joke, a visual joke. But then this happened. Speaking of visual jokes, uh, Donald Trump entered politics and uh, he dove in, or at least he belly flopped in. And you can see the other candidates skittering away like insects out of the pool. Uh, where to start with this man? But he, uh, I think this was after he body shamed a beauty pageant contestant and it soon became standard procedure to do the same to him. And this is a, a big part of going too far, I think, and the, uh, the danger of it. It seems like when you have a bully walk into a room and start insulting people, soon everybody's insulting each other and, and the dialogue goes very quickly, you know, it plummets, let's say. So, you know, I did a lot of cartoons just, you know, insulting what he looked like which you can't do and shouldn't do, but you do do with, with a person like this. But anyway, he's gone, supposedly. Whoops, how clumsy of me. Uh, this, was, uh, this was a weird situation to be in. This cover came out the day before the election when Trump was elected in 2016. And so, I mean, I didn't think he would win. I, I wasn't sure, but no one really knew it was going to be a close election. And we had to reflect that in the cover. We had to not say who won, but yet, you know, present what was going on. So this, this could have worked if Hillary had gotten in, no matter who won, this could have worked. But I think I had a sickening feeling that, uh, that what was going to happen was going to happen. And in fact, it did happen. Now this is the, this is graphically refreshing to look at after looking at all my uh, smeary watercolor stuff. This was the first cover of the magazine and they do run, run this every so often as an anniversary cover. And this is their, uh, their mascot, Eustace Tilly. He's a, you know, a sophisticated dandy looking at a whimsically at a, at a butterfly. And so when it came to do the uh, anniversary issue that year in 2017, it seemed, seemed like a funny idea to have Vladimir Putin who was big in the news of, you know, with the Russia situation and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Trump and have Trump as the little whimsical butterfly. And then it, it occurred to me to, to uh, what if we wrote the logo out in a Cyrillic alphabet? So it says the New Yorker in, you know, I, I shouldn't have tried to pronounce that that way. But anyway, those are Russian letters that basically say the, the New Yorker phonetically. And, uh, but then there was a, a, a big problem with it because to get the bulk postal rates, you have to write your magazine name clearly in the front of the magazine. So teams of lawyers had to meet with other teams of lawyers, but ultimately they, uh, they all hashed it all out or so I was told. Uh, this is Trump and his enablers. We'll be through with Trump, I think soon, hopefully uh, visually here. The nice thing about this was that it was, I didn't have to draw his whole face as you can see at the top left. And ditto here, you, not a lot of drawing of his face. And on this one, almost no drawing of his face. But this was, uh, you know, the mania about the size of his hands. So it seemed a funny way to tackle that was as a palm chart, 
you know, consisting basically of his boasts. So for instance, a very big heart, but not like an enlarged heart or anything, perfect size, or a line of intellect, fantastic, continues on to back of hand. Uh, you get the idea. Anyway, let's, let's look at some drawings that encompass the gray area between uh, too far or not too far. Some of these are questionable. Some of them uh, uh, didn't get published. Some of them I was able to eke through. For instance, the New Yorker uh, did agree to, to run this, but then they backed out of it. And this is the Indian, the Hindu deity for, uh, what's her name? Durga, pardon me. Uh, the many armed Hindu deity. I, I'm sure, it's, I'm not sure it's blasphemy or not. You, you can never be sure with deities, but uh, the New Yorker did decline to use it. And I was able to, to uh, get it published by airmail, Graydon Carter's uh, online outfit. Here's COVID-16 since Trump arrived in 16. The New Yorker came this close to running this as a cover, but they, I don't want to say chickened out, but they did not use it. And uh, this, of course, is Pope Benedict unwittingly airing his dirty laundry. This is several scandals ago. Uh, this one I wish they would have run it, but usually if, if it's in color, they gave me the go ahead and then because I'll send them initially a, you know, a very rudimentary black and white drawing. But I think they told me to go ahead, but then they decided against it. And basically what's going on here, in case it's not clear, if any of you have kids who have, uh, you might know about when kids put Mentos in Diet Coke, it causes like a little explosion. So these two crafty potential terrorists are, uh... anyway, you can see what they're doing. And this one is a uh, during Tiger Woods uh, marital infidelity scandal. I hope you'll pardon the vulgar metaphor, uh, as you can see in the green. The New Yorker bought this and then they balked. So I s turned around and sold it to Vanity Fair, who subsequently chickened out as well. And finally the Huffington Post took it, but then they told me they weren't going to run it. This is what's known in the cartoon world as a trifecta. Here's one the New Yorker wouldn't run. Fine Trump, I, it's, it's not who you think it is. Here's Trump stuck in an MRI. I don't know, does this go too far? I'm in the, I'm in amazing health, the best health. I'm speaking about him. I'm not talking about myself. Trump really, really loves America. I mean, he really loves America. And here's a, an attempted suicide joke. I, I guess that goes too far. That's supposed to be a clip on tie in case this doesn't read. Okay, well, this is the granddaddy of, uh, of going too far as far as uh, speaking personally for myself. Uh, this is when candidate Obama was being labeled a terrorist and a, a secret Muslim and all kinds of crazy, ridiculous fear mongering by the right wing media. I mean, it was everywhere. It was wall to wall. They were saying stuff about Michelle as well. And I submitted a sketch to the New Yorker, just incorporating everything in one single image saying, look how, you know, this will show how ridiculous everything they're saying is. I even had a little Nazi plate that was on the, uh, on the mantelpiece. They didn't want me to do that. But we did this and no one found it funny. And it was, you know, kind of horrifying. It was really all over the news and it was wall to wall. And a lot of people who didn't see it then, if they see it now, they're, you know, they're quite staggered by it. 
this was the initial sketch that I sent in, as I mentioned, you know, the black and white sketches, the rudimentary drawings. And in this one, it was probably clearer. You can see I've got the right wing pundits looking in aghast through the window. There's Bill O'Reilly and Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter. <clears throat> but it ultimately, it seemed that was taking away from the, you know, the iconic figures in the middle. And so we didn't do that. And maybe that made it, uh, you know, more difficult to read for what, you know, for many reasons, it was a misunderstood cartoon. A lot of people thought, you know, I get it, but what are those people in Kansas gonna think? And by Kansas, I mean Colorado and by Colorado, I mean New Mexico and by New Mexico. Anyway, here's uh, Stephen Colbert and John Stewart. I knew that everything had blown over because several weeks later, uh, these two comedians uh, reenacted this, the, the uh, the fist bump cover, and this was on the cover of the uh, Entertainment Weekly, and this was uh, this was a delightful thing to see, you know, for me personally, because there was a lot of angst involved in offending so many people with that uh, initial cover. And here's one some people didn't like. Uh, you know, Joe Biden is an he's an older American, an older person. I'm not sure if it's off limits or not. I think I've drawn him nicely. He looks happy. He just happens to be riding one of those uh, stair elevator things that I should probably get installed. Another ageist joke, and this is uh, Biden and Bernie running against each other. And I couldn't help but notice that the podiums they were standing at looked like one of those stress tests that you get. So. I don't know. I miss Bernie. Here's another joke for the whole family. This is Harvey Weinstein. It's hard not to go too far with a Harvey Weinstein joke. And I guess this is when he got sent to jail and is sort of saying goodbye to Harvey. You know, he's being called back in cinematic fashion like E.T. I wish everyone had a profile like Harvey. Weinstein, it's, he's wonderful to draw. Here's more bad taste. This is Rush Limbaugh's cremation as seen from outer space. When I first got to the States, when I moved down there, I, it was around the time Rush Limbaugh started his radio show and I would hear it and I would listen to it aghast. I had never heard anything like it, you know, I. There's really not much to say about that. I, you know, it was, it was like an American Don Cherry sort of. Here's another bad taste cartoon that I immediately retracted. I had sold it. The New Yorker wanted to buy it, but I, I uh, then they backed off of it. Anyway, it's obviously Donald Trump and Melania, and she's saying, I can't breathe, which obviously that that phrase has taken on some serious meaning lately and this is not funny and whoever drew it should be ashamed of themselves and all of that person's friends and relatives should be ashamed of them ah here's a little canadian content uh this was a drawing of conrad black that it was the only time i've been sued uh as a cartoonist he, uh, I was sitting in, in my rumpus room in Connecticut and, and the doorbell rang and I was served papers uh, because he was suing me and the writer. This was illustrated a story in, in Toronto Life about Conrad Black in hell, I believe. That little demon at the bottom right looks like Keith Richards to me, I notice. Anyway, sorry to be distracted. Uh, yeah, anyway, he didn't end up actually suing us. I think that the magazine took care of it. I mean, I wish they had let me know. They knew that that he was suing us and no one told me. So all of a sudden I was, you know, a little bit freaked out and called John McFarlane and, it, you know, I was pretty upset. And I think he, he was quite amused by that. But anyway, they settled with, uh, with Conrad Black and uh, now Conrad and me are great friends and we go camping. Here's some rough sketches that I send in to the New Yorker. These are, uh, none of these got 
turned into covers or were, were bought, but I thought you'd want to see maybe some uh, potentially, you know, ideas that were that went a little too far. Here's Trump. I can see great. Here, here's Trump getting a haircut uh, under general anesthetic. I, I don't know what that means. Here's Trump in, in uh, analysis. Here he is as a genius at the Genius Bar. I wish I could have done this one. It's surprisingly a lot of fun to draw Trump naked. I can't recommend it enough. Here again, naked. And the Washington Monument in the background, that, uh, that's not a metaphor for anything. Uh, the perils of wind. Uh, th we're almost finished, by the way. Uh, this, there are a couple of times I did drawings and, and cartoonists have talked about this where they say, you know, a cartoon often you're presenting a, an absurd situation and then it turns out to actually happen. And this was just a, all world leaders, major world leaders like laughing hysterically and you assume they're laughing at Trump. That was the, uh, the idea behind this one. And then you got situations and not just this situation where they're all laughing about him. And this one, it was a cover when I guess when he was inaugurated the first time and he's pretending to be in a car and pretending to hit the horn. And then here he is doing the same thing. Anyway, he's basically just knocking his head together. That, that wasn't a very grammatical sentence, was it? Anyway. Goodbye, Donald. And if there's anything else you'd like to know, just Google me. And I think that's pretty much it. So thanks very much. Thank you, Barry. Um, this is Karen here. I'm, I don't know if I'm coming up on the screen or not, but uh, yep, there I am. Good stuff. Um, thank you so much. And, and thank you for saying there are some that you don't understand. Because they're kind of like, you know, you're laughing, but you're not quite sure why. Does, does that happen to you with your own work? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that's almost a purest joke. You know, when you, when you, it's not something that, that, that's a formula or that you can trace why. I mean, if, if, if I've drawn something or even in things I see uh, by other people, and I don't know why, but there's something, you know, funny about it that's, you know, it's intrinsically funny or it's, there's, it's purely funny. There's something pure about that, I think. So, but I mean, there's some of those cartoons, though, that I should have an inkling about, you know, what they're about. It's not even that I don't know why they're funny. It's that I don't know what they're about. They, they come, that it's not a product of the rational mind that comes from somewhere else. Right. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't cartooning inherently have to go too far? Or is it a matter of like finding that line um, and just pushing it a little bit every time? Yeah, it does. It ought to. It's hard to, and it's and you have to be a little bit maybe braver than I am. There's a lot of, uh, even though I'm told not to self-edit by my editor over there, I, I uh, you know, you, you get filled with doubts, especially now. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of caution in the air as far as you know. There's so many there's so many ways, so many taboos, fresh taboos. You know, manufactured every day. A lot of them justifiable, some of them not. So there's a lot to worry about. But yeah, absolutely, it should. I, I mean, that's why you laugh. Laughing, it's it's breaking tension, you know, it's, uh, uh, and, and yeah, a, a good joke that, that you, I mean, I, I guess Louis CK, uh, you know, he's a bad word to some people, but I think he's a great comedian. He did a, a, a monologue on Saturday night, Saturday night live once that he got so close to the lines with talking about subjects that I would never make a joke about. And it was so artful to me, you know, to, to, uh, to, to, to delineate where the line was and just, you know, stick a toe over it, but, 
but you know, step back immediately before it, 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 you know, became, you know, vulgar or offensive. And yeah, that's it's it's it is about releasing tension, and I think that, you know, it's the best way to. I've I've heard comedians say that if you're performing publicly, you know, if you've gone too far, because what you think is funny all of a sudden there's a horrified hush. Uh, if you're cartooning, you don't know. You don't know. I will say though that in the last few years with social media, it's, it's amazing that it's as close to having an audience reaction as you can get. You know, the, the, I, I do a weekly online drawing for the New Yorker and they put it out and I can see, you know, if it gets no reaction at all or if it, you know, if it does up it ruffle feathers or, you know, what the reaction is like. So it's gotten a little bit better as far as, you know, because, yeah, I'm sitting in my room. So it's hard yeah. to know how something is received. When something happens like the Charlie Abdu shootings, and I mean, those cartoons were republished last year and bad stuff happened again. Does that, I mean, that must send a chill through, I mean, that, you know, hair, hairs on the back of your neck. Um, does it? Uh, I guess Charlie Hebdo, it, it almost feels like a different species of thing that I'm doing. And maybe I'm naive about that, but it seems like it's out to provoke, you know, and, and out to offend. And I don't feel like that's what I'm doing. I mean, I, I realize I'm doing things offensive sometimes and intentionally or not. But, but, you know, I've gotten threatening uh, messages for sure. And uh, I'm not a physically courageous person. So it's, it's, it's unpleasant, but I, I, I don't, that didn't particularly, you know, that horrible situation in, in, in Paris, it didn't, it, it didn't activate anything that I wasn't experiencing already, you know, fear wise. Uh, they just they published a cartoon about a month ago um, of the Queen um, standing on Meghan Markle's neck. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, and Meghan, of course, is saying, "I can't breathe." Um, uh, does that go too far? Is that deliberately offensive? Is that deliberately? If I think, well, I mean, I think that's funny. Yeah. But I, can, I can. I. But I feel. I, I feel the, uh, I, and I don't know the artist and you can never know a person's motives, but I feel, it feels to me like there were, you know, there, there is some amount of, of being purposely offensive. That seems to be the mandate of the magazine and God bless them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of cartoonists have, have given the indication or if not said directly that they, they are provoked by anger, that that's what gets them going. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that you're more uh, provoked by absurdity than anger. I don't know, if I, is that wrong, right? Uh, I think that's, that's probably true. I mean, I'm an angry person and I express it really badly. And uh, I think it would be very entertaining for the folks if, if you got me mad, if you got me pissed <laughs> off. You could see how ridiculous it is. But uh, anger provokes me for sure. But you're right. I, I mean, I love absurdity. I love Monty Python. I, 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 and st stuff like that is really what gets me howling, what gets me laughing is, you know, the, the, the more absurd, the better. When did you settle on that juxtaposition of the gentle watercolors and you know the, the vicious thoughts, as it were? That's a, that's a good question. And honestly, it's not conscious. And, and I, until things you know, started going well with The New Yorker and buying more and more of my stuff, I've always considered it a... a I still consider it. I mean, it's a big failing. I'd love to draw like Philip Burke and Steve Brodner who are vicious, you know, their lines are gestural and their caricatures are, are ex, you know, distorted and angry. And I, I wish I could draw like that. But when I, 
when I, uh, it's, but it's like a parakeet growling, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't work when I, when I try it, it's just clumsy. And I think that for the New Yorker, I mean, they're, you know, the magazine has always been, you know, restrained and, and the look of my work, I guess, suits it more than, you know, someone who, you know, whose work I love, you know, several artists whose work I love and, you know, I can't believe I'm doing a cover and, they, you know, they should be, they should be using their work, you know. So it's, it wasn't a choice, let's put it that way. I can't, I mean, I'm so timid with colors, I feel, you know, and I try and use stronger colors all the time and it just doesn't happen. It doesn't, it, I can't make it work. You've also said, or you've been quoted as saying, that every time you do a cover, you regret it immediately. <laughs> I mean, I can't, is that true? Just about every, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. And part of it's, you know, I wish I had drawn it more forcefully or I wish I had used, also, you know, if I have a week to do a cover, I'll send them several finished versions. If I have a day, I'll send two. I, I, I'll keep redrawing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm crazy. You know, so, and yeah, I do generally regret, yeah, you know, the subject matter and, and the idea and how I've staged it and the colors I've used and the drawing and the line quality. Aside from that, I'm usually thrilled with what I send. <laughs> I mean, isn't being a little crazy what it's kind of all about? I mean, it's what it's all about. Yeah, it's. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, of course. Uh, Françoise Mouly said, I mean, she always wants you to send in stuff that will make her laugh. And she always wants you to send in stuff that she can actually run. Uh, now, uh, what's the ratio? How much stuff gets, as it were, sent back? Oh, uh, I mean, if you want to, as a batting average, I doubt I'm, I'm, batting like a pitcher I mean it's probably 125 I'm mean, if it's one out of 10 it's good you know I send way more than they, than I use I, I'll send in lots and lots of ideas ideas come e you know relatively easy compared to sitting down you know I it's it's when I they say go ahead that I freeze up and tense up and it becomes most unpleasant and and, uh, and but I, I I generate a lot of ideas I mean I have a sketchbook and it's just filled with craziness. And I'll just, you know, redraw very quickly, you know, 10 things at a time and send her a bunch of crazy stuff. Do you self-censor? Yeah, I think I do. But she tries to get me not to. There's been a couple of times when I, I've sent her something and she said, oh, thank you very much for showing me that. You know, it's like something that she didn't, you know, I, I don't know. We all self-censor, of course. To a degree. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Otherwise, there'd be anarchy. <laughs> um, we're running a little late here. I should be uh, just asking for questions to come in from the audience. I've got, there's a couple of things here. Someone is asking basically, how much money do you make? Like, does cartooning pay well? I think is the question. Uh, it's no, I mean, I'm doing okay. You know, I, I'm, I do a regular cartoon for the New Yorker online every week. And I do a, a, a regular cartoon for Graydon Carter's airmail every week. So th those are, it's nice to have steady, you know, steady work that way. And then, you know, the New Yorker cover pays nicely. So, I mean, it's not it ain't the movies. My brother's a, you know, as a screenwriter and they, you know, they, I can't believe how much money they make, but I, you know, I'm doing okay. I'm going to have a sandwich after we, Good. After we do this and, and uh, I, it's all paid for and everything. And I'll watch TV, which has also been paid for. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I was reading today that Rush Limbaugh, his earnings came to 84 and a half million dollars. So I'm guessing you're not doing quite yeah, as well. <laughs> I'm not, no, I'm nowhere, you know, they, if you just remove all the numbers, I, and, um, 
yeah, you, I mean, you, I'm, I'm middle class or lower. I don't know. I'm, I, I couldn't, you know, I'm not going to give you a number, you know. I don't. Do you draw every day? And what did you draw today? I draw just, yeah, I draw every day. I think I draw every day. Today I drew, uh, I don't know, I had some crazy ideas. I Bernie Madoff died. So I drew him in hell with a new clientele and he's, He's uh, sitting at a desk in hell and Rush Limbaugh is there and uh, Jeffrey Epstein, you can see Saddam Hussein, like it's a bunch of people lining up. All your favorite people, yeah. Yeah, uh, his, his new clientele in hell. And then I drew, I wanted to do something with William and Harry and I drew them as, as the Smothers Brothers. And I don't know if, I'll, if that will land anywhere. And then I was had some thoughts about the extended Supreme Court with, with all of them, uh, because they're adding some Supreme Court members down here, I thought it'd be funny to draw a vast human pyramid of all the of all the Supreme Court justices. But those are the things I worked on today. How long would it take? Because this is in one of the questions that come in to turn a sketch. Presumably, that's what you did today into what you might call a finished product. I mean, what's the process? Well, the process is, uh, I mean, I can tell you, like, there was a cover I did of, uh, I didn't show it of when Brexit happened. I was listening to it, uh, you know, I guess on my computer that was Thursday night and the vote went through and surprisingly Brexit went through and then Friday morning, usually the magazine, the New Yorker ships on, on Thursday evening, it's sent to the printer. But there was an email to all to a bunch of artists on Friday morning saying, you know, we're stopping the presses. If anyone has a Brexit idea, it would have to be done right away. And I was sort of, you know, halfway through my oatmeal and kind of dizzy. And I had a couple of ideas and scribbled them and sent them. And Francois saw them and said, okay, do this one. And then I drew it probably in an hour and a half, two hours. And you know, it looks it. It's not a, it's a real quick drawing. And they, you know, they, were able to, I scanned it and send it. But basically, you know, I send a sketch if I get the go ahead and there's some time. I, I Google uh, all the reference that I need if I need a photograph of whomever and a car or whatever the situation is. And then I pencil it lightly. And then this is what you're asking, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then I did, I use a dip pen and I, you know, it's like the most inefficient possible way to work because they make you know, easy to use uh, waterproof pens now that you don't have to dip and stuff and these old pens clog and stuff. But anyway, I draw it in, in ink and then erase the pencil and watercolor it in just until it's overworked and looks like hell. And then I scan it and send it and then have, an, and then have an attack. Yeah. There's a, a heavy duty question here. Do you feel freedom of speech is being limited? And if yes, how do we correct it? I don't, I mean, by whom? I don't, I don't feel it. I mean, there, there's some pressure to, you know, to not make jokes about, you know, people who are, suffering let's say or or you know i mean there's a big thing about not punching down you know that that's an issue that cartoonists and comedians i guess talk about is and you want to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted or whatever and i've you know i think that if you can make a great joke at the expense of someone worse off than you it's got to be a damn good it's got to be a fantastic joke but you know I, and i'm not looking for those kind of jokes but there's sometimes you scribble things and it's funny to you and you know that you really wouldn't want to show it to anybody, you know, or it's danger, or it's kind of dangerous. And maybe there's maybe more, more, there's more of those situations where your things are dangerous, but I don't feel restricted really at all. Uh, particularly, I'm not more than, you know, 20 years ago when I started, or was it 30 years ago? I don't, I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't mind discussing this with the person who, who sent in the question, what, you know, what the, what well, the uh, I think it was, where, where have I gone? Um, anonymous. Oh dear. Hard to talk to. Oh, I, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that business about not punching down, that's exactly what the Supreme court 
is in Canada is about a comedian who was satirizing a man with a disability. So right. I heard about that. It was yeah. a kid, right? Wasn't it to start with the, the person? Sorry? Was, uh, he was making fun of a kid, wasn't he? Who was a uh, young was, man. Yeah. Who sang the anthem and he had, he, he was making fun of him. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, this is, these kind of cases make life worth living. I, it's, it's, it's interesting and it's, and it's arguable. I guess the restriction on speech is there's some things you're not allowed to argue. You know, when it gets to the point where people have differences of opinion about something and you're not allowed to argue about it, that, that gets, it gets difficult. But as far as my, I, I don't feel it in my work personally, particularly. Seems like a kind of gloomy note to end on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, everything's gloomy to end on. Well, we could, I'm sure we could, we could happy it up. Oh, happy it up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss Trump? I don't mean in your daily life. I mean, in your pen. No, I don't at all. I don't miss Trump. I have noticed, I've done some Biden drawings lately and, and they, they're all crap. You know, I just, it's, it's hard to, uh, and not just the likenesses, I just find it's, it's hard to get a nice man. It's hard to get an angle on him, but but I will, and and people are. But I don't miss Trump. I did not enjoy, you know, the last uh, of the four years we spent together, or five years. I the last three of them, I did not enjoy drawing him, and I don't miss him at all. And uh, you know, I don't ever want to see him or hear from him again, really. Although I have some great ideas in my sketchbook, I've never <laughs> used. You know, there's some really funny ones. So. You know, at least I'll be able to use those if he pops up, you know, with some awful appearances here and there, but I don't miss him at all. The time is ticking. I am going to have to say goodbye. It seems, yeah, just as bad to say goodbye on a Trumpian note, but there you are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you, Barry, very much. Um, hugely appreciated. And uh, really, uh, thank you for your time this evening and for your work. Thank you so much, Karen. It was fun. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And that's pretty well it from us this evening. Um, what was I going to tell you? There is a very fine coffee table book of Barry Brit Blitz's work. It's called Blit. And if you're in the Northumberland County area, you can get it at Furby House Books in Port Hope or Let's Talk Books in Coburg. And they are both giving a 15% discount for people who um, have come to know about these things through NLC. So I will leave you with that. I will see you again in March when we're doing our next event, this time on uh, basically how other countries handle aging better than we do. Anyway, Betty Ivory, Elizabeth Ivory, the chair of the board wants to say something. So let me just disappear and Betty will take over. Goodbye everyone and thank you. Hi everyone, I'm NLC Chair Elizabeth Ivory. And first of all, I wanna thank Barry for a fascinating peek into a world that very few of us really know anything about. That was so interesting and such a nice change. Um, before our audience signs off, could you please take a minute to answer a few short questions? Some of you did this last time, we really appreciate that. They'll show up on the screen when we uh, end the webinar shortly. Uh, so, also, keep these names in mind. Pat Armstrong, Canada's expert on successful long-term care that Karen referred to. That event is in May, not March. Erwin Kotler, international human rights advocate. Roger Martin, one of the world's leading business strategists. Terry O'Reilly, creator of CBC's Under the Influence. What do they have in common? Well, they are all upcoming NLC speakers. So we're really excited about the next few months. And in the meantime, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Have a good evening and please fill out the questions that will show up in a minute. Thank you. <laughs>